And the most wonderful thing is, as we sung a moment ago, and you reign, you reign over all. What a comfort that brings for God's children. In our difficult situations, when we threaten, when we confronted, he reigns. Turn in your Bibles with me. Please, I'm sure your Bible's open there already automatically if you have a Bible with you. And if you have a cell phone, <laughs> the cell phone also just opens there automatically in your Bible. Um, 1 John 5, verses 6 to 13, we'll focus on today. And we're focusing on God's final word, God's testimony, but also his final word concerning his testimony. Let's read together from verse 5. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. It is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement here. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God, that is, does not have life. I write these things to you, believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Nothing in this life is sure but death and taxes. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin wrote those words way back in 1789. It was true then already. Nothing in this life is sure but death and taxes. But of course, a wise man like, a wise man like Franklin knew Many things are also sure as well, spiritual things. Christians know that there are many certainties. And when it comes to spiritual realities, we're not afraid to say, we know. We know. In fact, the word no is used no less than 39 times here in the letter of John and no less than eight times in this closing chapter. You see, we have a deep desire to be sure about life, to the extent that some will even dabble the, uh, in the occult in an attempt to find out something for sure about the future. And you'll be shocked when you start doing research just about who and how many people will consult a fortune teller, for example. But what that tells me is people want certainty. They want to be sure. But let me also tell you that a life that is real is built on God's certainties in Jesus Christ alone. The world may think Christians are proud and dogmatic but this never keeps us from saying, I know. The introduction to 1 John points out that at least one reason John wrote this letter was to encourage Christians to have great assurance of their salvation. He's writing to Christians and he wanted Christians to know that they are saved not just for a few days or for today, but for all eternity. So what did he do? He stressed the historical ground of the Christian faith. And he also gave us three tests, remember. Love, 
If you love the brothers and you love God, you know that you were born from born of God. Obedience is another thing. Not, not obedience as a, as a burden you bear, but obedience, a willing obedience with joy. Well, you know, you're a Christian. And what you believe in is also a good test. Sound doctrine. What do you believe about Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? What did he come to do for you? His character, his identity, all those things. Those are all, one should say, uh, verifications of the fact that someone is saved. And now here in verses five, uh, chapter 5, verses 6 to 13, John goes back to the beginning and he shows us that the historical truth about Jesus Christ's life and ministry are in fact the ultimate basis for the Christian's assurance of salvation. And God the Father, that is really the thing here, God the Father bears solemn witness to this. Now how does this work? John's answer is that faith in Jesus as the Christ is based on the evidence in the testimony that is given about him. And it's because this testimony is from God that it's sure and trustworthy. So the first point here this morning, very important, we get it from, this, from the verses here. John calls in three witnesses. Imagine it's almost like a court case. And John calls in three witnesses that confirms what God the Father says about his son. And in fact, that it is true, 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 and true forever. Verses 6 to 8 again. Just read there with me. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify. The Spirit the water, and the blood. And very importantly, the three are in agreement, complete agreement. I'm sure in court, if people come and tell their stories, there will always be some story that doesn't quite match up with the others. Witnesses are not always totally reliable and credible, but here they are all three in perfect agreement. But before we go any further, here is an interesting story you may find helpful as we come to these verses today. Some of you may have some of the older translations, like the, like the King James Bible before you, or like Carol, the more holy Bible, the new King James Bible. Wonderful translations, uh, but they are just translations, they're not perfect. And neither of our translations are perfect. There's always leeway uh, where things can not be so clear and so on because they are translations. When you move from one language to another, they are, you always lose something, even though it doesn't matter how much you try. But uh, if you have the King James Bible or the New King James Bible before you, uh, you need to take note that the whole of verse 7 and the words in earth in verse 8 should not be there. Uh, the one commentary writer I consulted, a solid reformed evangelical, said it should be deleted. Now this has been done in the texts of the NASB, the New American Standard Bible, the New International Version, in the ESV, Evangelical Standard Bible, one people love to use, especially evangelicals in these days. Many evangelicals were, were involved in that, including John Piper and a few others. And most of our other modern versions of the Bible don't include those verses, or those words, verse 7, and the, the words, in earth. Why? Because the idea of the three heavenly witnesses. If you read the King James, it will say that. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit comes from 
notes written by a Spanish Christian named Priscillian. This was sometime before his execution on the charge of heresy in AD 385. He wrote those words in the margin of some old Latin manuscript. And from there, it was passed on into future texts. It was added then to the Latin Vulgate, the only official translation for hundreds and hundreds of years, if not thousands, more than a thousand years in the church. And this happened at about 800 AD. At this time, also, that was in 800 AD, the balancing words in earth were also added in verse 8. But how did these added words, present only in the Latin manuscripts, get into our English texts that are based on the Greek, te Greek texts rather than the Latin translation of the Greek? Again, it's a very interesting story. At the time of the late Renaissance and Reformation, that was a time when classical texts were first being edited critically again. A very important man, Erasmus of Rotterdam, produced a Greek text for the first time, One, a, a, a compiled Greek text where the words in question were missing. That was in the early 1500s. At this time, most of Europe was using the Latin Vulgate as its authoritative Bible version. So you can understand that Erasmus was quickly criticized for omitting the passage, those words, verse 7, and the words in earth. And when he was challenged, he replied that the words were not in any Greek manuscripts not in the oldest manuscripts that they had. Foolishly, though, he, he added that if a Greek manuscript with, words in, with the words in question could be produced, he would include it. <laughs> Unfortunately, such a manuscript was quickly found. But it was not an old one. It was written in 1520, and Erasmus knew it was fake. Nevertheless, he'd given his word. So he included the words in the third edition of his text, published in 1522. But he did add a note that said he believed this new Greek manuscript was written on purpose just to embarrass him. So understandably, from Erasmus's text, this was passed into uh, the German by Martin Luther, and also into English by William Tyndale. And this manuscript is now in the library of the Trinity College in Dublin. I think you can go and check it out. And you'll probably see Erasmus's note, not in the original Greek. Don't get me wrong here. There's nothing wrong with the three heavenly witnesses in themselves. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It does not affect our faith at all. But the point is simply that John did not write those words. They were added later by mistake. And praise God that John, what John wrote is, is what most modern versions give us. And it is because of this was discovered through textual criticism and so on. I need to mention that to you because if you have a different, if, if you have a King James Bible or a New King James Bible, there will obviously be some questions about that. But there are some more questions here about these verses. It's John's reference to the water and blood in verse 6 and the threefold testimony of the Spirit, water, and blood in verse 8. What we are sure about here is that John is establishing the historical factualness of the incarnation and the earthly life of Jesus Christ and God's testimony to it. We said it already, but exactly 
what do they mean? Those words. Well, as far as I'm concerned, two possible, possi- two credible possibilities here. If you go, other people present four or five different interpretations, but the most credible are these. Probably the easiest is to take the water as a, as a reference to the baptism of Jesus and the blood as a reference to his death. I say so because John is obviously stressing the historical grounds for our faith here. That means that there's an emphasis on the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. And in one sense, that started with his baptism and ended with his death on the cross. And both these events, God intervened miraculously to bear testimony of this and also to authenticate Jesus. Remember, when Jesus was baptized, what happened? A voice from heaven said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Matthew 3 verse 17. And then, when Jesus was crucified, several miracles occurred. Three hours of darkness, remember? Yes. The curtain in the temple was torn in two. An earthquake. Rocks split open. Tombs were opened. Many holy people were raised from the dead as well. And that was to authenticate Jesus' ministry. And... What also makes sense in this view is that John was opposing the Gnostic false teachers. Remember, they taught that the historical Jesus was not the Christ, but rather only a man on whom Christ the Messiah or Christ the Deliverer from heaven descended at his baptism and who deserted him just before his crucifixion. You may have heard about teaching like that. And you'll find it all over the church today also. Find some strange ideas people have. Even well-known people will come with this idea. So John would be teaching that here there is only one Jesus, the Christ. He was present on earth, not only in and through his baptism, but also in and through his crucifixion as well. So you can understand that that is a good view. But another view is possible, and I like this view. You must remember that in the context of these verses, John is talking about the Father's witness about Jesus. Just like in John chapter 5. And that's another uh, principle of hermeneutics. When you come and interpret the Bible, and if you want to understand the Bible, is this one. Uh, The principle is that Scripture interprets Scripture. So you can't base everything you think and your whole theology on one little obscure verse somewhere and then come to some conclusion. You need to look at the rest of Scripture and what the rest of the Bible says about the same issue. And if you do that here, in John chapter 5, we see that God's biggest witness about His Son is through the Bible, the Scriptures, even though other witnesses are mentioned as well. And Pastor Marinus illustrated that so well here this morning when he referred to the promised Messiah in the Old Testament uh, through David and a few other instances where the Old Testament was looking forward to the coming of Christ. That was bearing witness. The Bible was bearing witness to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. John chapter 5, verse 37 to 40. Just read with me and you'll see. John 5, verse 37. Just go there. The Gospel of John. Not one John. The Gospel of John. Jesus is speaking and he says, The Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You have never heard his voice nor seen his form. Nor does his word dwell in you for you do not believe in the one he sent. Now, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. Well, these guys were studying the Bible, they were memorizing the Bible, but in a mechanical way. 
They could quote verses left, right and center. They knew a lot, but one reality was missing. Jesus Christ. You diligently study the scripture because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures. This is the point of the scriptures. That testify about me, says Jesus. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. And if this is so, the only place we will find the scriptures uh, here in 1 John chapter 5 is in the word water. And I say this because water is used as a symbol for the word of God in other places in the Bible as well. Just a few examples, Psalm 19, 119 verse 9, uh, John 15 verse 3, but also Ephesians 5 verse 26. I'll just read it for you. You remember those verses well. Uh, Ephesians 5 verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her, how? By the washing with water through the word, you see. And there are some other passages as well. So the question is, can water symbolize the scriptures at this point? I think so. Oh yes. And if this is the case, then the threefold witness of the Father about Jesus in verse 8 involves each member of the Trinity. The Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit's witness within the individual. Blood is the historical witness of Christ's death as the focal point of his ministry. And water refers to the uniqueness to, uh, uh, to Christ through the inspired scriptures. And John's point here is that to reject these three witnesses would be to reject God's witness and call the only true God a liar. And the emphasis on the fact that there are three witnesses and these three witnesses agree make us think of that very important Old Testament principle. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. It must be established legally, officially. So this is the truth. It is established in, perfer in perfectly legal way as laid down in God's word by two or three credible witnesses. Now, as we go on, we now need to look at God's testimony compared with people's testimony. Look here, verses 9 and 10. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed in the testimony God has given about his son. John now tells us why God's testimony should be believed. First reason, God's testimony is greater than human testimony. Yet we accept man's testimony at least at times, in fact, many times, especially if you know the person is trustworthy. <coughs> so John's argument is very straightforward here. Think about this. When you speak to people who won't believe, you can point them to these things. He says, all day long, people trust one another. They trust the doctor. They trust the, the pharmacist or the chemist. They trust the cook in the restaurant, and we like to do that. They even trust the person driving uh, on the other lane on the road, even in Malthus Bay. So John is saying, 
If we can trust other people, why can't we trust God? People accept the witness of other human beings every day of their lives. Otherwise, they won't be able to sign a contract, pay a bill, buy a ticket, go with the shuttle to Vintuk, or get onto a taxi or a bus, and do many other thousand things that make up daily living. Well then, says John, why should you not believe God, whose word is trustworthy? And the moment someone believes God, what happens? If it is in faith, trust God. Well, the Holy Spirit comes and gives us an internal assurance that what we believe is trustworthy. That is the Holy Spirit's work. And he works together with the assurance we can get from the word and the blood. They're all three in unison. The Holy Spirit testifies to it. And that is the deep certainty that the Holy Spirit himself, himself gives us, my brother and sister. But on the other hand, John also says here, if a person doesn't believe God, if they remain stubborn and stiff-necked about it, they make God out to be a liar. Because what they are saying when they don't believe is that God cannot be trusted. And here we see the atrocious nature of unbelief. Hey, John Stott wrote when he was still alive, unbelief is not a misfortune to be pitied. Oh, shame. They can't believe. And Oh, no, no, no. Sies toch. Hulle gaan hel toe. No, no, it's not that. It is a sin to be hated and deplored. It is sinfulness lies in the fact that it contradicts the word of the one true God and says he is a liar. And then lastly we come this morning to God's own testimony. Verses 11 to 13. This is the testimony. Read with me, please. Read in your Bible with me. It's very important because this is the point of expository preaching is that you see the word and uh, this is how I prepare my message. It's from the Bible. It's not a story I've made up or I've gone and put together. This is, I'm trying to open up the word of God. This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. That is as definite as you can get. And I write these things to you who believe already in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Well, talking about God's testimony uh, as fully trustworthy may lead someone to ask, too. But what exactly is God testifying to here? What is the essential content of God's revelation? So John says, the testimony is this, God has given us eternal life, and this life is life in his Son. Now, the testimony is all about our eternal salvation, too. And at the center of it is the truth that salvation is found in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and in Him only. And the words eternal life takes us right back to the opening verses of the letter where John showed us that this eternal life was revealed in Jesus, who is Himself eternal life. So, eternal life is not merely a long, long time as we like to think of it. It's the very life of God himself. And it will culminate, my brother and sister, in a quality of life that can't even be imagined by people the side of glory. 
But this life is not to be enjoyed by everyone, however. This life is in Christ alone. The result, it is as impossible to have life without having Jesus Christ as it is impossible to have Christ without at the same time possessing eternal life. Toward the end of John's Gospel, not first John here, uh, John's Gospel, in chapter 20, verse 31, John gives the reason why he wrote all 21 chapters of his Gospel. He says, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is, the gospel was written primarily to people who were not Christians yet, to lead them to become Christians. But now in a parallel way, John takes this argument one step further. And he gives us his reason for writing 1 John. He says in chapter 5 and verse 13, I write these things to you who believe already, have been saved already, in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. So John is writing to Christians, and his purpose is to lead saved people to full assurance of their salvation. And what follows is just postscript, and we'll look at that next time. Where do you stand today? Have you trusted Jesus Christ? Have you believed in God's Son? God testifies to this. And if you don't want to accept it, you're saying God is lying. He swore to it. Hebrews tells us he sworn an oath about this. You must believe. Otherwise, there's no hope. Whatsoever. It's just hopeless. I spoke about this one day when our family was together around the, the table at home and we were sitting there and eating and we were talking about these things and then one of the kids says, without Jesus, it is just hopeless. Yeah. Where do you stand? Have you trusted him? Are you still trusting him? What if you are? John says he wants you to know you are God's child. Let nothing change that. You are secure if you stand in Jesus Christ. Yes, this body rots away and the world is in a mess and we don't have money and the, well, the water goes off and there's blackouts and who knows what else. People die. We will die. But we are secure when we stand in Christ. In fact, death has passed over us. We will never die. We will be in glory forever. So don't chase after this stuff in this life. Sure, we need stuff, but don't... Whoo, Yes, I've got these ambitions for this life and I want to do this and I want to do that. Well, it may be okay, it may not be okay. The thing is, pursue Christ. That is the important thing. That is what will last forever. Jesus Christ. Hey, today many people dismiss claims that one can have sure knowledge in spiritual things and they say it's presumptuous. But it is not right, according to John's teaching here and the rest of the Bible. God has ordered his revelation in Christ so that those who believe in Christ may know for sure that they may be convinced that they have eternal life, eternal salvation. And the real presumption is in rejecting this assurance and so cast doubt on God's word. Amen.